You ready? All right, let's do this. Hey guys, what is going on? This is Travis and welcome back to Coffee, Computers and More. And today I'm sitting here with my dog Charlie who is recovering from a cystotomy. And I just wanna talk about the whole experience, what it's been like and what to expect in case you're a pet owner uh, that's gonna be going through this procedure with your animal. Um, there's a lot of videos on YouTube that are basically the procedure and what happens. They're like vet videos. And I'm just talking to you guys as a dog owner from the dog owner perspective. What to expect, a little bit about the costs, uh, what I noticed in him and, and what resulted in the surgery that he had to go to, that he had to go through. Um, so, so first of all, let me just kind of give you a little bit of background on him. He's eight years old. He is a Welsh Pembroke Corgi. And about three months ago, he had an encounter with a couple pit bulls. My neighbor was out with his pit bulls off leash. It was about one o'clock in the morning. I took him out for just a quick tinkle uh, before we hit the hay and the dogs came over, charged my dog. They immediately bared down on him. Luckily, this happened within about five seconds and the owner just yanked the pit bulls off my dog. Well, in the process, my little guy kind of got thrown a little bit onto the concrete. And I brought him home, I checked him, no puncture, no bite marks, no visible wounds. He seemed to be fine. In fact, he was kind of jacked up on adrenaline, kind of bouncing around all over the place. And I just figured he was okay. The owner apologized, you know, we talked about it and uh, nothing ever came of it ever since then. Well, about a month later, I noticed that he had been getting really lethargic on our walks. I was practically having to tug him along where normally we do about a mile and a half walk every day. And uh, he tugs me along. He's got a lot of energy. Well, it just wasn't there. So I thought, well, maybe he's just slowing down. Maybe he's getting old. Maybe it's dietary. Maybe something's going on. Oh, First of all, let me apologize for the lighting and the audio. We're in the entryway of my apartment, which is about 15 feet by three feet. And that's the area that Charlie here is gonna be limited to uh, while he's recovering. Now, normally he's got a lot of energy in the morning and the evening post-surgery, but as for right now, he's just snuggled up with his favorite possum and he's having a little uh, afternoon nap, if you will. So um, anyway, let's just kind of talk about what's going on. So anyway, back to the story with the, with the pit bulls. Uh, about this about 30 days after the uh, attack I took him into the vet and I said let's do some x-rays and make sure there's no shoulder damage or spinal damage or damage to his hips I just want to make sure that he's going to be okay and when they did the x-rays they called me in and they showed me three basically dying sized stones in his bladder three and a half there was a little chunk of another one and they said hey your dog's got uh, got he's got bladder stones which I guess dogs tend to get bladder stones instead of kidney stones and he goes we've got to take him out he's not going to be able to pass them naturally if they block his urethra it's going to kill him uh, he'll get a buildup of toxicity in his system and he's going to die, which is actually a, a common condition from what I've read about corgis. It's something that they can develop. So anyway, the um, cystotomy, uh, cystotomy was something that was recommended by the vet. So first of all, I'm not a vet. I barely made it through high school biology. I uh, <laughs> don't really know what all these terms are, but I'm going to try to read them to you the best I can. So if you notice your dog straining or if you notice any kind of blood in their urine, uh, if you notice them just kind of like seem like they're in pain or if you're petting around their tummy area and they're maybe wincing, he was actually kind of uh, physically shaking and kind of twitching as he would stand there when we come back from the morning walks along with being lethargic. And I thought, you know what, this is not good. I want to make sure he didn't have some kind of neurological disorder or anything like that. So again, the x-ray showed us what was going on. So then the uh, cystotomy was something that was going to happen. Um, the, the veterinary hospital I went through in Lincoln, Nebraska, Yankee Hill, fantastic. Uh, their, their surgeons did a great job on him. I dropped him off at 7.30 in the morning and the surgery was done by 5.30. He actually walked out. He was obviously under anesthetic and pain meds and stuff, but he did walk out. And it was the first, you know, kind of kind of 24 to 48 hours that were, that were pretty rough. You know, we came in, he was obviously in a little bit of pain. Um, his area, they had used a laser scalpel instead of a knife to cut him open. I elected for that because it was supposedly heal faster. It did cost me a little bit extra. And I'm going to go through the price breakdown of what I paid as of July of 2022, just because I think as an owner, you need to know what's going to be coming your way and what I paid, which may be like the average, the average price that a person's going to pay, uh, or not. So, um, anyway, the recovery, the first 48 hours when he was coming off the anesthetic, he would just like sit up and just kind of stare off in the distance and I tried to get his attention and he wasn't very responsive. The only thing that kind of scared me was there was a little bit of like spotting, a little bit of fluid coming out of his incision area and it would kind of look like little, little, like little smear marks of kind of blood on the floor. Wasn't dripping, it would only happen when he would lay down, a little bit of seepage going on. I really kept an eye on it and luckily after about 24 hours that seepage started to reduce, that blood was gone. Um, here's the thing though, so like I said, we're in a very limited area. You've got to make sure that this guy doesn't stretch out, that he's not running or jumping because those first 48 hours are going to be absolutely crucial. You're trying to have a, you know, a wound that's healing. You're trying to prevent infection 
and so on. And so it was pretty rough that night. I actually slept right here on the floor in a blanket next to him because he was kind of wincing a little bit. And I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something that was going to happen. Now I'll show you guys some photos of the operation. They're a little rough to look at just because it's, you know, it's an animal that went through surgery and you can see all the, uh, the, the staples. It's about a, a four inch incision that ran the length of his bladder and they had to go a pretty lengthy cut because they had so many stones to get out of it. And one of them was actually towards the back where the urethra begins and they definitely had to get that one out. So luckily we got them all out. They did x-rays afterwards. There was a lot of extra options that I opted in for because I thought, you know what, I'm already in this uh, full anyway. We might as well just go uh, full scent, right? And just give him everything he's gonna need to have the best recovery he can. So um, that area, you really gotta watch out with that area, especially when it comes to dragging over stuff. You know, He's only got about uh, two inches of ground clearance, so maybe an inch and a half, so he rubs against everything that he walks over. So you've gotta keep that area dry when it comes to recovery, otherwise it's not gonna heal. The other thing that was pretty rough was the first night he had the e-collar on and he was just bumping into everything and couldn't get comfortable. And um, I think it's called an Elizabethan collar, if I'm not mistaken, it's those plastic collars that you see dogs wearing. And we did that the first night and then I went ahead and got him an inflatable collar, which he only wears under my direct supervision, mainly because if this thing would deflate, he could probably get his head out. It does attach around his regular collar. This was from Chewy. I think it was maybe $15 and it fits him really well. What works well with a dog that has short legs with this kind of an inflatable collar is he just kind of sits down and it makes a natural pillow. He was much more comfortable the second night after I put this on him and was watching him. Now, he still gets the e-collar at nighttime and we're about seven days into the procedure right now. And um, he's gotten used to that collar. So I use that at night just because that's gonna stay on and it's very slick. And uh, you know, so that, that's the main thing is you wanna make sure the animal's comfortable. As soon as I put this thing on him, the little guy just started taking a nap. You could tell he was automatically more comfortable. Now, your vets might advise against this. A lot of people just fire and forget. They put this on to let the dog go. You know, that you do whatever your veterinarian says is best for you, but I, I'm doing this under his supervision. I don't leave him unattended with this thing on. We do take it off for breaks. I did put his standard collar back on him for walks. We normally do a shoulder harness, but I didn't want it pulling in the wound area or potentially pulling back if I had to pull back on him and getting below his chest. You know, the shoulder harness can move a little bit occasionally. I didn't want that to happen and even get remotely close to the wound area, the incision area, so that's why we're not doing the shoulder harness right now. Just strictly sticking with his neck harness. Um, walks, here's the thing. I mean, he like, the next day, you know, obviously with his pain meds, his doggy ibuprofen and his muscle relaxers, you know, he wanted to run around and jump around and play. It's almost like he was, he did a 180. He's exactly how he was, you know, six months ago before he started to slow down, before these stones started to develop. And, um, you really, really got to be careful. You got to make sure that he's not going to jump up on things or jump down on things. You don't want that wound to open up again and then have to take him in, especially after hours, say at night or in the evening where it could cost you even more money. So uh, you just really, really got to take it easy those first couple days. Like I said, we're about seven days in. I'm taking him out. We're only doing about 50 yards out, 50 yards back, a little bit of sniffing around the lawn, a lot of peeing going on. Yeah, the first couple days after the surgery, there might be some tinted urine. He just has like a, a golden yellow urine. You know, you got to check it to make sure there's no blood coming out because you want to make sure there's no internal damage. But the first couple days, you might have a little bit of seepage going on out of the wound. You might see some different color urine from normal. But after a few days, the urine color should start to go back to what it was before. Now, the stones were sent in for analysis and analysis, and I don't know what they're going to find. That's going to tell me what we're going to have to do to prevent them from coming back. If we can, you know, it could be something where there's a reaction to his food that's causing a buildup of that calcium in the bladder that forms the stone. Um, it could be something he naturally produces like human beings, it happens. He gets plenty of fresh water. He's had nothing but science diet, uh, wet and dry food pretty much his whole life since I got him when he was three. And uh, he recently switched from puppy to adult and those stones have been taking time to develop. So something in, in his environment or the environment was causing that to happen. Uh, let's talk about cost. Okay, what's this going to run you? I was a little terrified when they said he was going to have to have a surgery because I keep having all these flashbacks of people that do these GoFundMes for $6,000 or $8,000 surgeries for their dogs. I didn't know what to expect, so let's just get it out there right now. The procedure was predicted to be $1,835. It ended up being 1930 and that's because I elected for the laser scalpel, which was an extra like 50 or 60 bucks, and then also an extra set of x-rays when we were done however many it took to see what they needed to see to make sure that he was totally cleared out. I thought, you know, if he's already under the knife, let's go ahead and make sure it's all gone. I could have just said no if I wanted to, gone off their opinion, but I wasn't going to take a chance, especially if I'm already paying for this. So let's kind of go through the list of what happened. I'll talk about some of the meds that he's on, the aftercare and so on. So the sedation uh, for a dog that's less than 50 pounds is 65 bucks. 
His catheteriz catheterization was $45. Intravenous fluids were $55. Uh, hospitalization for canine was $50. That's kind of that daycare that he gets for a person to be with him the whole time. Uh, anesthesia and monitoring was $140. Laser surgery fee was $75. The cystotomy itself, uh, canine, is $1,200. Uh, digital radiographs, 14 by 7, was $155. Stone analysis, once I get it back, is $35. Elizabethan collar was $12. Um, Carprofen, which I think was his doggy ibuprofen, uh, for 10 of those is $15.60, and those are broken in half. He gets a half one in the morning and half one at night. The Zenequin, which is his um, antibiotic, he gets half of that. He gets um, half once a day, and that's it. He gets that in the evening. And then the muscle relaxers that I give him were something that we had before to kind of ease some of his tension pre-surgery. He gets um, one of those in the day. He gets one of those at night also. Um, oh, nail trim was 15 bucks since he was already under. We went ahead and trimmed his nails so that way if he starts scratching at his belly, there's less of a chance of hitting those wounds with long, sharp nails. They're basically just cut down now to where they should be. And the go-home instructions were free. So um, he'll be going in for a follow-up this week. And, and right now, you know, I, like I said, he's going to be in pretty good shape. So we're looking at about $2,000. You know, there's things like pet med, I think, that you can get, which is a uh, low-interest, long-payment form uh, for, for pet uh, procedures that you have to get done. There's pet insurance that's out there. I kind of wish I would have got it on him. It was going to cost me about 35 bucks a month and I never did it. It probably would have paid for itself right now. Live and learn. So like I said, he's eight years old right now. We're hoping for 12 to 15 years. I don't know how long corgis usually live. You take care of them and give them a good diet and they're going to be fine. So, um, let's see, where are we at? So yeah, so post care, um, you know, they say go light on the food when you first bring them home because the anesthetic is going to cause their stomach to be kind of woozy. I wouldn't give them a lot of, a lot of food, maybe, maybe a third or a quarter of what you normally give them because they're going to be hungry that night. I've switched over to just basically all soft food at this point until uh, everything is all clear. It's just, I think, easier for him to digest. It's easier for me to hide the meds in his food. And that's the other thing, too. Those pills are broken in half. They're very bitter uh, underneath their coating. And if your dog gets a lick of that, they're not going to take it. So. A couple things you can do is you can stuff it in chunks of meat and give it to them and they'll just chew it right up. I basically put it on a plate, just covered a whole packet of, of tenderloin gravy pedigree. The little guy just laps it up and eats it with no problems. Once in a while he'll find the pill and spit it back out. Otherwise, the final um, straw, the final thing you can do is just a big old dab of peanut butter and just put that tablet in there and they'll eat it right off your finger if your dog can have peanut butter, okay? This little guy does not that often. I primarily save it for medication. And so that pretty much... Um, is what we do for the meds. He gets a doggy ibuprofen in the morning, he gets one at night, and he gets his antibiotic in the evening, and hopefully he'll be off that this week. Didn't really notice a difference in his stool and his bowel movements. It's a little bit softer just because of the uh, um, the soft dog food I give him. And it, things aren't going to look like they normally do with your dog for a couple weeks. Just understand that if you got like <laughs> diarrhea or you've got him acting weird, there's a lot of temperature adjustment they go through because of the surgery. Try to keep them in a calm, cool environment. I try to keep the lights low. I've got some music playing. I've got a fan blowing upstairs so there's air coming through here constantly. It's like 72 degrees down here in the entryway. And he spends most of his day sleeping. After a couple days, they'll get back to how they were before. But the key is to just be very, very careful with them, especially if you've got to load them in the vehicle. Don't let them jump up. Lift them from the front. Lift them from the back behind the tail and put them back in, especially if you have a corgi. You don't want to put any pressure on that staple area or strain. They can kind of roll around a little bit. And they're going to be fine, but I'm always paranoid that a staple is going to pop out, and then we're going to have to take them back to the emergency room. So, again, very limited. It sucks. It's not fun. If you can get somebody lined up to watch your dog for up to 14 days, that would be great. Like I said, I've got stairs here, so the little guy has to stay down here. But it's going to be rough the first 48 hours. Just be, be wary of that. And always have paper towels handy. I would use that to kind of mat his, his belly to kind of press that area just gently and kind of keep an eye on the seepage coming out of the wound, which, like I said, after about 48 hours with him was basically done. Um, also understand if you're pressing in that area, that's where they urinate, so you could get a blob of urine on there. Don't mistake in that for, like, pus or blood because it's not. It's going to be just... That's a perfectly round circle that's that's urine and that's normal, okay? If you get, like, some splats in there or some, like, weird-shaped blotches, that's probably going to be seepage of blood that's coming out of the wound. Obviously, make sure you got your vets on standby and uh, you're going to be all set to go because nothing would be worse than dropping a couple thousand dollars on a surgery and then having the dog not recover from it, not make it. So make sure you go to a good vet. Make sure that the the, the vet that's operating on your dog has had some experience with it. Uh, Yankee Hill had, had great, uh, wonderful staff, and, and they know him by name. And uh, consider getting the inflatable collar, and uh, you guys will be all set. So anyway, 
This is Travis, and that's uh, the journey with my dogs, uh, Cystotomy. And uh, it's been kind of an adventure this summer, and, and luckily I've got the free time to be able to help him with my job and kind of keep an eye on him. But uh, again, don't rush the recovery. Don't expect a speedy recovery. Every dog rebounds differently, and everything's going to be fine. All right? So you guys take care. I want you to have fun. Be safe. Please like and subscribe. And as you know, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.